That all being done, I want to invite our first speaker, which I'm really honored to have with us today. Um, Dr. Ellen Wong is a neurologist, neurobehavior specialist who did her training with us here at Rancho Los Amigos and has agreed to stay on with us um, and work with us as we continue to grow our center. And Dr. Wong is going to talk today on risk factors for cognitive decline. Please welcome her to the podium. Thank you so much, Freddie. It's definitely my honor to be here. Um, so I'm Ellen Wong, and I'm going to be talking to you guys today about risk factors for cognitive decline. Um, I sprinkled in here some pictures from my travels because it makes me happy to see them, and I hope that it makes you guys a little happy to see them as well. Um, this picture was taken at sunrise in Thailand, actually, my last trip before the pandemic started, so that feels like a lifetime ago, but here we are. Um, so. Some of my objectives for today are that by the end of this talk, you'll be able to list the most common risk factors for cognitive decline across the lifespan, identify risk factors for cognitive decline that seem to be most amenable to intervention, and describe some of the interventions that are proven to have the most impact on reduction of risk factors for cognitive decline. So as a quick intro here, um, so kind of building off what Freddie said, so right now, we believe there's about 50 million people with dementia worldwide. That's projected to increase to 152 million by 2050, particularly in low and middle income countries. And the number of people with dementia has doubled since 1990. In high in income countries though, there seems to be a decreasing incidence of dementia and we think that that's likely related to changes in ed education, socioeconomics, healthcare and lifestyle. Um, but the global cost for taking care of these patients is about a trillion dollars annually. And things that kind of go into that is that people with dementia have up to anywhere from 1.4 to four times more hospital admissions than others who do not have dementia with similar illnesses and their hospitalizations tend to last longer. And so overall the healthcare expenditure is probably double for patients with moderate to severe dementia than those who do have no dementia. Um, and so that's why it is so important for us to start thinking about how to reduce the risk of developing dementia in the first place. And to that end, um, the Lancet Commission's published this 2020 report of dementia prevention, intervention, and care. And I'm just gonna highlight some of the um, hard work that they did here. They went through hundreds of studies and did their own reviews and meta-analyses when necessary. And I'll try to again summarize the most relevant and interesting ones for the purposes of today. So a lot of you have probably seen this figure at this point. Um, it comes up in a lot of dementia talks now. Um, but basically, we're going to walk through each of these factors. These are the risk factors that the commission identified as being important in the risk for dementia. And we're going to walk through each of these kind of one by one, organized into life stages and impact. And hopefully you can see the percentages in this slide, but basically the percentages represent the population attributable fraction. So that's the fraction of all cases of dementia in the population that might be attributable to this specific exposure. And the thought at the end of the day is that modifying, let me see if I can get my cursor to, no, okay. Um, so I can't point it out on the slide, I think, but um, the hope is that modifying these 12 risk factors might prevent or delay up to 40% of dementias. And that would be really great. So some of the challenges that they faced in creating this uh, compilation, and here's just a little picture from a hike that I took where there was a challenging way to go and a not so challenging way to go, and I will say that we went the challenging way. Um, so most of the evidence that we have comes from high income countries, but with the increase in life expectancy and greater risk factor burden in low income countries, the number of people with dementia are rising low, uh, more quickly in those countries than in the high income ones. So the studies may not be so representative of that population. It can be really hard to identify the direction of causal relationships. And then many of these identified modifiable risk factors have impacts on one another, so they're not completely in a vacuum independent. It's really difficult to do randomized controlled trials for most of these risk factors since it would be against the standard of care. Continue. Okay. Sorry, hopefully y'all can hear me. Um, and then the randomized controlled trials are often performed looking at cognitive scores in cognitively normal patients. And so the kind of 
um, expandability of those results is difficult to always figure out. And then there's also a lot of confounders when looking at observational retrospective studies. They often have to end up using proxy measures for the different uh, measurements, so like social isolation, cognitive reserve, and et cetera. Um, with that being said, let's go through some of the factors that they've identified. So starting with the early life risk factors, the one that was identified in early life was having less education. And so we need to start with this idea of a cognitive reserve. So this is the idea that we have, each of us has a reserve of cognitive ability that protects your brain from brain pathology. And this allows for adaptability and preservation of your cognition everyday functioning despite the presence of potential disease. Um, the kind of robustness of the cognitive reserve is thought to account for the difference between one individual's clinical picture and their neuropathology. And the cognitive reserve is thought to be impacted by things like education, occupational complexity, leisure activity, physical activity, and social engagement. And so we'll see a lot of those topics kind of covered through the next um, 20 minutes or so. So first starting with cognitive reserve and dementia. So education level had a population attributable fraction of 7%. And there were studies showing that childhood and lifelong higher educational attainment reduces dementia risk. Um, another idea behind this is cognitive maintenance. So per people who have high cognitive engagement seem to have reduced risk of dementia. And there was a large Chinese study of uh, people over 65 years old who showed that those who read or played more games more frequently had a reduced risk of dementia. Uh, another study followed pa uh, participants between 20 and uh, over 20 to 30 years, between the ages of 30 to 64 years old, and found that those who engage in travel, social outings, playing mu music, art, reading, and speaking a second language seem to maintain their cognition better. Another idea in kind of the grand scheme of this is retirement, and so um, there is this maybe use it or lose it hypothesis of cognitive decline, maybe unfortunately. Um, an older retirement age seemed to be associated with lower risk of dementia. Uh, this was done in a French study, I believe. And there was also uh, found to be a two-fold increase in episodic memory loss that was attributable to retirement in um, another, this was a U.S. health and retirement study. So that goes through the early life risk factors. Now we're moving into midlife risk factors, and there's several more here. So this will go over hearing loss, traumatic brain injury, hypertension, alcohol use, and obesity. And so hearing impairment, actually hearing loss had the highest population attributable fraction for dementia. And it may, we think, contribute to cognitive decline through reduced cognitive stimulation. And even subclinical hearing loss seems to be related to lower cognition. So um, there were studies showing that patients with normal cognition and hearing loss seem to have an increased risk of developing dementia over the course of 9 to 17 years that they were followed. And even studies that showed that the increased risk of dementia worsened per every 10 decibels of worsening hearing loss. So the degree of your hearing loss may be related. There, were also, um, there was also a study showing that midlife hearing impairment was associated with a steeper temporal lobe volume loss particularly in the hippocampus and the entorhinal cortex, which we know are very important for memory, um, in participants who had started off without baseline cognitive impairment. So, so one good thing about this is that hearing aids exist. Um, and patients who were over 65 with self-reported hearing problems who use hearing aids did not seem to have an increased dementia incidence when followed over 25 years. So um, we do like to encourage the use of them. And uh, further evidence, a cross-sectional study showed that hearing loss was, seemed to only be associated with worse cognition in patients not using hearing aids, so again, same idea. And then a different uh, U.S. survey of people over 50 years old, followed every two years for 18 years, found that immediate and delayed recall deteriorated less after initiating hearing aid use. So even you, once the hearing aid use is initiated, it seems to help with maintaining the cognition. So moving on here to the next, next risk factor identified by the commission is traumatic brain injury. So in looking at traumatic brain injury, the risk of dementia doubled in older adults who had concussion over a mean follow-up of 3.9 years. And uh, traumatic brain injury increased the one-year dementia risk 
for uh, participants with t TBI, and that risk remained elevated over the next 30 years, although not quite as much as in that first year, and that was found in a Swedish cohort. The, uh, the risk seemed to be worse with severe or multiple TBIs. And then another study on veterans showed that there was, again, increased dementia risk associated with TBI severity. There's also another sequelae of TBI um, that we can talk about, um, just chronic traumatic encephalopathy. So this is thought to be the result of multiple frequent, even small TBIs over time, for instance, associated with playing soccer or football. And so one study of former soccer players from uh, Scotland showed that these players were more likely to have Alzheimer's disease on their death certificate than the general population, with a hazard ratio of 5.1, so quite a bit higher. The next risk factor we'll talk about is hypertension. So elevated systolic blood pressure, and that's defined in the study as over 140 uh, millimeters of mercury, was associated with an increased risk of developing dementia. And that risk seemed to increase further if the hypertension persisted into later life. So that original was from a mean age of 55, and if patients continued to have hypertension, they had increased risk of dementia. Um, in the study, people who were able to maintain ideal cardiovascular parameters had a lower 10-year risk of all-cause dementia, as well as vascular and Alzheimer's dementia. Um, and the ideal cardiovascular parameters included things like making sure that you were um, at the ideal lipid levels, had normal blood glucose, um, normal blood pressure, maintained a healthy diet, um, getting the physical activity that was recommended. And they also found, um, or there was also a study showing that midlife hypertension was associated with reduced brain volumes and increased white matter hyperintensity volume, but not necessarily to amyloid deposition, which we know is important for Alzheimer's disease. So some of the things that we could consider doing for cardiovascular risk factor interventions. Um, so the SPRINT MIND trial showed that there was decreased dementia and mild cognitive impairment when patients were treated with intensive blood pressure control, meaning a goal of systolic blood pressure less than 120, versus those um, treated with standard treatment, which is a goal of systolic blood pressure less than 140. There was no particular antihypertensive recommended um, based on these studies, but you may be able to see from this chart here that um, there seems to be a trend towards even less risk if in those using angiotensin receptor blockers highlighted in that box there. Um, with regards to treatment for other cardiovascular risk factors like hyperlipidemia, statins unfortunately were not found to prevent cognitive decline or dementia. Uh, and aspirin also, which um, is a commonly used as secondary stroke prevention, didn't seem to reduce dementia risk in healthy adults over a period of 4.7 years. Um, and again, this, is a, this was a randomized controlled trial of people taking aspirin not as secondary prevention, so that's not to be taken as that aspirin isn't important for secondary prevention because it definitely still is. Um, and then the last fact, actually, second to last factor here is alcohol use. So excessive alcohol consumption does seem to be associated with cognitive impairment and dementia as well. Alcohol use disorders particularly were associated with increased dementia risk and the relationship seems to be particularly strong in younger onset dementias. So that's defined as those um, onsets of dementia in people who are less than 65 years old, which overall comprised 5.2% of all dementias in this study, but 56.6% of those people had alcohol use disorder noted in their records. So definitely a much larger proportion. And then another study showed that drinking over 21 units of alcohol a week and abstinence both were associated with a 17% increase in dementia. So um, kind of the extremes of either end. There's also a study showing that drinking over 14 units of alcohol was associated with right-sided hippocampal atrophy, again, an area important for our memory. Um, and each unit of drink is usually defined as either a 12 ounce beer or one shot of hard alcohol, a glass of wine. So the last one in midlife that we wanna talk about is obesity. 
So obesity is also related to late life dementia in patients who are um, who have it in their midlife. And there are several randomized controlled trials that do show that weight loss is associated with improvement in attention and memory in overweight but cognitively normal patients. So again, not necessarily, um, not too many studies in patients with dementia specifically, but in, even in cognitively normal patients, there is some improvement. So now we're moving to the later life risk factors, and this will be smoking, depression, social isolation, physical inactivity, air pollution, and diabetes. So with regards to smoking, um, there's many studies showing that smokers have a higher risk of dementia than non-smokers. And unfortunately, secondhand smoke exposure uh, in the study of women aged 55 to 64 was also associated with more memory deterioration, with the risk increasing with exposure duration. The good news is that stopping smoking at any time seems to reduce the risk. So in a study of 50,000 men over 60 years old, um, if they stop smoking for over four years, that seemed to reduce their dementia risk over the subsequent eight years. So it's never too late. Another risk factor identified for late life was depression. And there's unclear mechanisms here of whether depression causes dementia or vice versa. There's evidence both ways. Um, but there was a study that found that even a single depressive episode could be a risk factor for dementia. And that was based on a meta-analysis of 32 different studies. And then another study showing that late-life depression seems to be associated with increased dementia risk, while earlier symptoms are not. Um, and unfortunately, in this study, it found that the use of antidepressants did not mitigate the risk. Um, but on the other hand, there was another study from Australia showing that over four years of treatment with an SSRI did seem to delay progression to clinically diagnosed Alzheimer's disease. Um, in this case, there may have been some difference they felt with patients Perhaps the ones who seek antidepressant treatment may be different from those who are not treated. Um, but there's also evidence from am animal models that SSRIs reduce amyloid plaque generation and formation. So there is some, some theory behind that. The next risk factor here that we'll talk about is social contact. Um, this was one of my favorite comics growing up. Um, so less social contact actually increases the risk of dementia. And there was this study that showed that increased dementia risk uh, was found in people who are lifelong single or widowed compared to married people. Um, but of course, there were probably confounders in that. Um, they found that maybe the, the lifelong single people in their study may have had worse physical health overall. Um, so not to ruin hope anywhere. Um, and then other studies found that social engagement was quite protective uh, more frequent social contact during the late to middle age was associated with modest reduction in dementia risk. And again, there's not a lot of randomized controlled trials for uh, addressing this, but there was at least uh, this one by Kelly et al. showing that in 576 adults, there seemed to be improved global cognition and increased brain volume in participants who had uh, facilitated meetings and discussion groups. And then another important risk factor is physical inactivity, which kind of plays into <laughs> my couch potato. <laughs> um, physical inactivity, which plays into a lot of the other risk factors that we've already discussed. Um, but this study of a 44-year study of Swedish women showed that there was a development of dementia in 32% of those who had low fitness scores and 5% in those with high fitness, so quite a bit difference. Um, Good thing, again, is exercise is associated with a lower risk of dementia, but it likely needs to be sustained for benefit. And um, there's also some confounding there because patients may exercise less during that prodromal dementia phase as it is. Um, another study showed that participants who were between the ages of 30 to 60 years old with uh, who were doing moderate to vig vigorous physical activity in midlife had um, the association of reduced dementia over a period of 25 year follow up. So exercise, again, um, there, is a, there is a shining beacon of hope at the end. Um, so a meta-analysis of 39 randomized controlled trials of cognitively normal adults over 50 years old showed global cognitive improvements with moderate to vigorous exercise, uh, resistance exercise, and aerobic exercise. Although this study didn't show an effect for yoga, but yoga is, of course, helpful for many other things. Um, and in this study, dementia was not an outcome measure. So again, there's just um, limited evidence here. 
But meta-analysis of three randomized controlled trials lasting for one to two years with um, people with normal baseline cognition found that the dementia incidence was 3.7% for exercisers and 6.1% for control. So the exercisers had uh, lower dementia incidence, but this was unfortunately a little un underpowered. But overall, the um, World Health Organization, the WHO, recommends physical activity as it has at least um, definite beneficial effect on normal cognition and may have a possible effect on mild cognitive impairment as well. And that's particularly true with aerobic exercise. So this is still very highly recommended. Um, air pollutants are another significant risk factor. Um, this picture was taken, I'm not sure how familiar this image might have been to multiple of you, um, but this was during the fires just a couple years ago. These are the San Gabriel Mountains. Um, so that's a significant source of air pollution as well. So there have been animal models showing that airborne particulate pollutants accelerate the neurodegenerative process. And other studies um, in human population showing that high particulate matter of 2.5, uh, NO2, and carbon monoxide exposure increase dementia risk as well. Uh, let's see, so the last factor that they brought up here for some reason in late life. Um, so type two diabetes is clearly a risk factor for future dementia. And um, diabetes is associated with an increased risk of all cause dementia. And there seems to be an increasing risk with the duration and severity of diabetes. There is another study showing that taking metformin was associated with a lower prevalence of cognitive impairment and reduced dementia incidence, which is good news. Um, but they also point out that it may be that those participants who are taking metformin or patients taking metformin um, may have had less severe diabetes, not requiring insulin, so that may have had something to do with it as well. Um, I would argue that perhaps this risk factor could be placed earlier into the midlife portion instead of just the late life because it does affect you through the lifetime. So other important risk factors that were identified by the commission but not given a PAF were delirium, sleep, diet, and COVID-19. So delirium, um, this is defined as a disturbance in attention and awareness which develops over a short period of time, hours to days, and represents a change from the baseline and fluctuates throughout the course of the day. So patients with delirium were more likely to be diagnosed with dementia in the future, and that may be because delirium has some neurotoxic effects that precipitate dementia versus that these patients are, uh, had previously undiagnosed cognitive impairment and um, then had delirium. Patients who are known to have prior cognitive impairment do seem to have a 15 times risk of developing delirium in the hospital compared to those who are cognitively intact. And patients who have dementia seem to have a faster cognitive decline after an episode of delirium. So prevention of delirium can be a very important part of dementia prevention. Sleep is also another important thing. Um, so sleep disturbance has been linked to beta amyloid deposition, reduced lymphatic clearance, increased tau, and cardiovascular disease, all of which we know are related to dementia. And sleep disturbances seem to increase the risk of all-cause dementia and Alzheimer's dementia. There does seem to be a U-shaped association here as well, where sleeping too much or too little um, are both associated with increased risk of mild cognitive impairment and dementia. And studies showing that patients taking hypnotics may be at greater risk of dementia regardless of sleep duration. And it's kind of, again, um, some controversy over the directionality of that causality. But new onset sleep disturbance may be a part of prodromal dementia. And so there are some studies that suggest that hypnotic use might be actually an effect of um, this prodromal dementia rather than the cause of dementia. Diet is also an important thing that we want to talk to our patients about. So um, there was a longitudinal cohort study of pe uh, people ages 58 to 99, which showed that those eating over 1.3 servings per day of vegetables had less cognitive decline over a 4.7 year follow-up than those who reported the lowest intake. And in this study, they concluded that that was the, um, the, almost the equivalent of being 11 years younger if you were eating over 1.3 servings per day of vegetables. With regards to other dietary interventions, um, there have been multiple systematic reviews of randomized controlled trials of supplements that don't show um, significant evidence for any specific supplements. 
Um, but there have been several meta-analyses that found that the Mediterranean diet seemed to improve global cognition compared to not taking the Mediterranean diet. So from the WHO standpoint, the recommendation is the Mediterranean diet on the basis of possible help and minimal harm. But uh, supplementing with vitamins B and E, polyunsaturated fatty acid, and multi-complex supplementation is not recommended um, on just an everyday basis. Lastly, um, COVID-19 did have an impact on dementia as well and the risk of dementia. There was a study of uh, 3,000 survivors of COVID-19 in Wuhan who were followed for a year after their um, after getting ill with COVID-19, and they found that they had an increased risk of cognitive decline, and the greater severity of their initial illness was um, associated with greater cognitive impairment. During the pandemic, COVID-19 had a very big impact on our patients in general. 25.6% of the deaths um, in 2020, at least, were related to uh, involved patients with dementia. And there was a 16% increase in dementia-related deaths during the, that beginning of the pandemic. And patients, as we know, in care homes were at particularly high risk, um, potentially just being exposed more. And in U.S. nursing homes, the patients with dementia made up 52% of COVID-19 cases, but 72% of all the deaths. So in summary, um, here's Big Sur. So the 12 modifiable risk factors were identified here and are thought to account for about 40% of worldwide dementias. So there's a lot of potential to reduce dementia risk. We need to place an emphasis on physical health to reduce overall health care costs and burden and overall well-being in a multidisciplinary approach. And some of the suggestive preve suggested preventative measures from this study were to encourage the use of hearing aids for hearing loss and also to encourage protection from excessive noise exposure. So make sure you're wearing those earplugs during concerts. Uh, reduce exposure to air pollution and secondhand tobacco smoke. Try to prevent head injury. Limit alcohol use to less than 21 units weekly. Avoid smoking and support smoking cessation at any point. Maintain your systolic blood pressure less than 130. Reduce obesity and diabetes and sustain midlife and late life physical activity. And the idea is that by addressing all of these risk factors, we think that we can reduce the neuropathological damage that's done by them and also increase and maintain cognitive reserve and thereby prevent dementia. So again, it's really important to be ambitious about prevention. It's never too early, it's never too late. Um, it can be protective for people with or without genetic risk, so everybody can benefit. And avoiding and delaying potentially modifiable dementia should be a national priority. So thank you all for listening and being here. And um, I don't know if we have time for questions, but okay. <laughs> thank you.